Let's get to work. Let's talk about the language that you're going to talk with police officers with. Okay? What is therapy? How do you describe therapy to a police officer? I'm not saying you've got to copy me, but this is what I find works. Rather than, oh, you know, we're going to sit and talk about things and you're going to get opinions and we're going to do scenario training. Very similar to what you used to do in the academy. We're going to talk about things that happened to you and we're going to learn a lot of different things, different ways to handle it. It's basically scenario training. Our goal here is change. Our goal here is change. Change happens by first looking at what you did after the situation, talking about better ways to handle it, until you finally integrate it and you start doing it during the incident that happens. And finally, you'll be able to avoid the situation because you've got, will have gotten good enough. That's change. Don't expect change to happen immediately. We're going to go through these scenarios, and you're going to have to say, well, this is very similar to the scenario I had last week. You know, this is very similar to what's happening with my wife. We'll go through these scenarios, and we'll talk about the things that happen. I explain, because we, we have a higher intelligent level of police officer. I imagine most here in California you do too. You know, we generally have 105, 110 IQ as a low base. I explain scientific principle to them. I don't just blurt out, well, let me tell you about entropy. But they'll come up with a scenario and I'll say, oh, that's, like, that's entropy. And I'll say, what the hell is entropy? We all learned it. You know, if you had a high school basic physics class, you learned entropy. What is entropy? Things go to most disorganized state unless work is applied. Things go to a most organized state unless work is applied. The funny thing about entropy is when things reach maximum entropy, they cannot change. When you get close to maximum entropy, it's harder to change. For example, the alcoholic. Things go to a most disorganized state unless work is applied. What happens with the alcoholic? Well, they just sort of let things happen, let things happen. Things get very disorganized, very disorganized. They get on the brink of collapse. Rock bottom is not rock bottom. Rock bottom is when they're dying of cirrhosis. That's when they have maximum entropy. Things go to the most disorganized state unless work is played. That's why you need to go for 28 days, because you've reached a maximum level of entropy. That's why you have to do a very strong intervention, because you've reached a max maximum entropy. Anybody who's seen a picture of my desk, anybody that's had teenagers and saw their room, that's entropy. <laughs> that's a perfect example of entropy. Things go to the most disorganized state until work is applied. You notice what I'm doing. I'm repeating entropy over and over and over. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes, but that's what you have to do when you're teaching somebody. Repetition. If you want change, you better have a lot of repetition in your speech. You better have things that people can grab onto. A lot of repetition. How do you know it works? Six months down the road, they go, Oh, I had a great example of entropy. And I'm, not, I'm not really sure where I learned that concept, but I had a great... That's when you know it's worked, because it's been integrated into their personality. Science. The... First law of motion. Inertia. A body in motion will stay in motion. A body at rest will stay at rest. When a body is having some motion, it's easier to change that motion than it is to start it up. A body at rest gains inertia. 
a train that's sitting in the train yard gets rusted. It becomes almost impossible to move, almost impossible to change. You have to do the change slowly, which brings a concept of therapy that I'm going to talk about later, but the concept of therapy that's very, very important. Sometimes you've got to get the person changing before you start working on the problem. Remember, if you're going to get somebody to change because of inertia, if they're sitting in one spot, it's going to be harder and harder to get them to change. But if you start them changing in unusual types of ways, drive to work a different way, clean up your room, stupid kinds of things, they get in the process of change. These are, these are scientific laws, but they work psychologically as well. They work psychologically. They work if you repeat it. A body motion stays in motion, body rest stays at rest. I'll say it five, seven times in a therapy session. So much that the person says, would you stop saying that? And you go, I'll stop saying it when you start saying it. OK. So then they repeat it. And they say, OK, I'll stop saying it until the next session. Body in motion stays in motion. Body at rest stays at rest. And finally, relativity. You've all heard these concepts, right? Everyone's heard of what relativity. Let me explain relativity to you in the way that I found it was most, most useful. Rachel and I are on a plane. I want to, this is Rachel, by the way. I want to toss Rachel a ball. I don't know Rachel from before. <laughs> I toss Rachel a ball. She can catch it. That plane is moving 530 miles an hour. But I can toss her a ball and she can catch it. Because the plane is a system. And when you're moving in a system, you're able to do that. Because relatively, relativity means everything is moving in that system at the same rate. If there was a hole in the plane, what would happen to the ball? It goes smacking up against somebody's head. But because the system is a closed system, I can toss her the ball and she can catch it. That's relativity. In a closed system, I can toss the ball and she can catch it. Why is that important? Because closed systems have their own tendency to maintain themselves. Therefore, if your client is going to start changing, everything is going to be trying to hold them in and not change. That goes from, if you ever read um, oh, it was some book about high school that, uh, about all the patterns in high school when they came back for a reunion, they all, everybody puts people in the same pattern. If you were the intellectual in high school, you're still the intellectual, even if you've been in jail 10 times. Closed system. If a person starts changing in a marriage, what's going to happen? Well, believe it or not, their husband or wife is going to try to get them to do the same things. That's what's predictable for them. That's like throwing a ball to Rachel. Relativity. Why are these three scientific principles important? Because you want to develop the language with the people that you're going to be working with. You want to develop the language. You can use these concepts in 300 different ways. I always set up my session where I let them just talk and ramble for about 45 minutes, and then I get the last 10. I say, OK, I'm going to teach you something in the last 10 minutes. And what ends up happening is after 30 minutes, they usually say, OK, I've said enough. Come on, what, what do you got? What do you got today? These, it sounds gimmicky. But that's what works with cops. It's what works with cops. Danny and I have a list of probably 150 things that, and we've tried probably 1,000 to try to get them to work. And we have these lists that, of things that work. That's what works with cops. That's what works with cops. Let me give you, uh, I call it metaphors, fairy tales, and sound bites. They work with cops. You know why? Cops were like football players. Cops were the high school baseball players, right? Okay? They're used to motivational speeches. 
They're used to people having, giving him phrases. Go out and win that game for the Gipper. They're used to those things. Win one for the Gipper. There's a, there's a phrase. And cops, when you're talking to them, and even the female cops, if it's something they can remember, and you've said it 10 times, they start applying it. And they apply it in places where you're sitting there going, geez, I never thought of that. So let me give you some of the ones that I like to use. When I use a teaching metaphor, I always like to use cop metaphors. For instance, Joe, when you're going up to a uh, traffic stop, and you're standing there, and a the guy says, look, I know I was speeding, but the guy behind me was, was riding my tail, and I had to keep moving to get out of it, make sure I was out of his way. What do you say, Joe? Who's driving your car? Who's driving your car? That's what Joe says. Okay? Because that's what cops would say. Who's driving your car? You or the guy behind you? I like to use the one because I just know that this is what cops do. They know the bathrooms in their sector, and they sort of drive around the bathrooms when their stomach's a little upset. You know, they know there's one in a firehouse, and there's one in McDonald's, and they, they know the bathrooms, which ones are likely to be used. So you tell them, you know, sometimes you just have to change your life a little bit to be prepared. It's like driving around looking for bathrooms. You don't want to be driving around looking for that bathroom. You don't want to go back in the precinct and have, have your pants soiled. So it's like driving around looking for bathrooms. And they come up with ways, metaphors that they use all the time. Um, the routine call. When, when are most cops shot on the job? Actually, about half. During a routine call. Routine traffic stop. Five minutes. Routine traffic stop. Those kinds of things. Fairy tales. These are my favorite. The Rumpelstiltskin effect. Anybody remember Rumpelstiltskin? You've got kids, right? Rumpelstiltskin was the, uh, the little mannequin that uh, the girl couldn't have any children, couldn't get married. He tells her, I will let you get married, but you have to, do, you have to give me the firstborn male child. So she goes, she marries the prince or the king. She becomes a queen. She gets pregnant and has a child. And the guy comes and says, I want, my, I want your firstborn male child. And she goes, oh, he's a prince. You can't have him. And he says, well, tell you what, if you can remember my name, if you can say my name, you won't lose your child. And then, you know, she, the prince, the Queen ends up finding out the name. The Rumpelstiltskin effect. What do I use that for? Sometimes, and we know this, sometimes in therapy, if you can put a name to it, it has a, a more meaning than if you don't have a name to it. ADD. Man, that name really caught on. That was big. That really caught on. Much more than hyperactive. Nobody wanted to hear hyperactive. My kid's hyperactive, but Attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, that caught on. The medicine of the day. You know, we're using SSRI drugs. Zoloft is a miracle cure when it came out. If you put a name to it. And this is so strong that medicine companies actually come up with names for their drugs, other than the clinical name. The Cinderella fantasy. The Cinderella fantasy is basically people who believe that if they sit in their house and they love all the animals, somebody's going to knock on their door and make them a princess. So you go through that. Hey, you know, when you're getting a girl who's dating, if you're not getting out there, no one's going to knock on your door. In 28 years, I've only had one person who found their husband knocking on the door. He was a neighbor. and came over and uh, was returning a dog or something like that. It's not going to knock on it. It's not going to happen unless you do something. And what, is, what does doing something mean? Breaking through entropy. 
I have a few others, but let me, let me just go through to the, to the last one. The Princess and the Pea. Guys love this one. Princess and the Pea. Sometimes there's just one little pea and 14 mattresses. And that damn woman just comes up with that one little pea and complains about it, no matter what you put on top of it. The princess and the pea. Or he's stuck on something that happened 25 years ago. Princess and the pea. And finally, sound bites. Mark Twain described it as a minimum of sound to a maximum of sense. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This was their finest hour. Yesterday, December 7th, is a day we live in infamy. Senator, you are no Jack Kennedy. Read my lips. No new taxes. You remember these. They're just sound bites. That's all. Well, why not give your officers some sound bites? Let me give you some of my favorite. It's better to get your way than make your point. I started introducing, introducing that when somebody's constantly arguing, saying, you're just trying to make your point. You're not going to get anywhere. It's better to get your way than make your point. If you were thinking, you probably could figure out how to get it your way. But you've got to argue. Arguing does no good. What makes me feel better? Great. So you can make your point and not have what you want. Long Island is a place with water all around it, thus the distinction island. <laughs> In the riptide of emotion, swim sideways until you can swim toward the shore. Because everybody knows this. It's just the one word different is emotion. You're saying to somebody, hey, if somebody's just emoting, just hold your ground. Go sideways. You'll eventually be able to get in. And finally, cut your emotional losses. Go toward your goal. One five-word sentences that you repeat numerous times Therapy is repeating, repeat numerous times, and there's hundreds of them. I mean, you can make, make up a phrase for anything. Repeat them numerous times, and they'll start getting into people's heads. Well, you know, as you always say, it's better to get your way than make your point. That's, that's what happens in therapy, I'm telling you. Whether the cop's 150 IQ or an 80 IQ.